Sup fam of the genus Homo, well, welcome back to episode three of five on human origins. There's this logical fallacy called survivorship bias. Super interesting. The most famous and overly cited example is from World War II. See, researchers were trying to figure out why some pilots returned from bombing raids and from attacks and others didn't. So they looked at the returning planes and where those planes were shot the worst. And they thought, okay, here's what we should do. We should put armor where there's all these bullet holes. That's where they're hitting the planes. We need to make sure and protect them so they can all come back, right? A mathematician looked at that problem and they said, mm -mm, you're alleging here survivorship bias. They were not counting the planes that didn't come back at all. They were gonna add armor to the places on the craft that turned out to be fine. The planes made it home, even though they'd been hit. Instead, we needed to armor the places where these planes hadn't been hit. And this is a logical fallacy that once you recognize, you can see everywhere. For example, every article about investors who made billions from the market. Are they geniuses? Not really, they are the survivors of this economy. We can learn by looking at them, but we should look at them and also the people who failed to get the real picture. Scientific journals publish papers of experiments that find something new, not those that prove something that we know because they want people to read their scientific journals. This gives the bias impression that only statistically wild papers are valuable. Meanwhile, thousands of scientists toil to move science forward with confirmations of research in basic science and don't get credit. That is survivorship bias in action. But you can also apply that to us. Why us? Why humans? Why did we survive and all of these other ancient people didn't? We need to look as broadly as possible to understand it. Some ancient beings, when you broaden your view, turns out were better than us at some things. And then some weren't. We, of course, are limited to what has survived through the geological record. But knowing that, the experts I talk to keep saying that we survived for the same few reasons. Adaptation, symbolism, and cumulative culture. So let's kick into it and explain it. Okay, so adaptation, symbolism, and cumulative culture. What are these things? Adaptation is the ability to change over time and adapt to new environments and new experiences, new kind of anything, actually. Symbolism is assigning information to something that wasn't necessarily obvious. For example, if I decided that a stick was called a stick, now I have to name the tree and the branch and the rock and the soil and everything else because that isn't obvious all on its own that this is a stick, right? Okay, I'm glad you're coming with me on that. Cumulative culture is the ability to pass knowledge on to others. And combined together, this is the trifecta, say, my experts that I talk to here, for why humans succeeded where others failed. So first, adaptation. As ancient peoples moved and spread around the world, some adapted to their locations, growing taller, learning to eat new food. It was not like Kelly grabbing an ear of corn and being like, that's a delicious, we can eat it. It was actually way more complicated than that. There are hundreds of generations of people eating things that disagreed with them or that they didn't digest very well or that outright killed them. Many thousands and maybe probably way more than that died throughout those generations. But eventually, someone mutated some genes that allowed them to digest something that the others couldn't, and that gave them an advantage. More nutrients equals more advantage, stronger, better, faster, louder, whatever. For example, 10,500 years ago, cows first appear in our historical records. They were domesticated in Iran, and a 2012 study found genetically the 80 original cows who basically populated everyone today, like the Adam and Eve, the, uh, Mooses, if you will. <laughs> Neanderthals were probably intolerant of milk. You, you would be weaned as you would grow. That's the normal process of any mammal and the genes that allow you to process milk turn off. However, some mutants in Homo sapiens didn't have that problem, if you wanna think of it that way. Essentially, they were able to continue to digest milk after being weaned. And it only happened with certain groups. So 96% of people in Sweden can drink milk. 
even into adulthood. 80% of the Swiss, the Spanish, the Finnish, uh, and 83% of people in Southern Sudan, they can all drink milk and get nutrients. They'll feel fine. However, the norm worldwide is actually lactose intolerance. That's the human, the homo sapien norm. And Neanderthal was gone long before we domesticated cows, so of course all of them as well. 100% of Native Americans are lactose intolerant. 99% of the Igbo and Yoruba people in Nigeria are lactose intolerant. 90% plus of people in like Japan and Thailand are lactose intolerant. And of course, my sister-in-law who is very lactose. You don't even wanna, we don't even wanna go there. It doesn't mean that people can't drink milk, but they probably wouldn't choose to. Sidebar, of course, that's a benefit of cheese. You can eat that and it's got less lactose in it. You might be able to, you know, break it down. Maybe not still, sorry. But that's just one example. That's one example of an adaptation that we were able to develop over generations of us trying to eat stuff that we probably shouldn't. Us mixing with Neanderthals was also another way to adapt. And that was huge for humanity. Uh, it wasn't just one mutant that, you know, we mixed one time and then popped out a mutant and was like, this is the, the Neanderthal human pro promised land. It was probably generations and generations of mixing over many thousands of years with some genetic wins and some, not so much. I talked to Rebecca Rag Sykes, who just wrote a book called Kindred, all about Neanderthals. She, of course, is a Neanderthal expert. It's that some of the genetic stuff that came over from them, um, we didn't want, and we got rid of it quite quickly through natural selection. It was not wanted, but some of it was, in particular, um, sort of genes connected to uh, metabolism and also immune systems seem to have stuck. And that makes a lot of sense because number one, if you are a tropical adapted species like we are moving into the Northern Hemisphere, then you're going to be encountering different kind of climate, but also, you know, conditions where you, your metabolism might need to adapt. But also you will be moving into a continent with new pathogens, you know, new diseases, having a little bit of Neanderthal immunity to could have actually been super beneficial. So the question of exactly what we got, what our bodies did with that, and, and whether it was useful or not, um, or even just, you know, neutral, that's one of the, the really big areas that many different research teams are sort of investigating. You're probably thinking the same thing I'm thinking, like, did Homo sapien queens whop some Neanderthal kinks? You know what I'm talking about that? Yeah. So uh, would that not be a new species if they did? And based on what we know, the mixing happened about 55,000 years ago, give or take, and it happened over a short period of time. And we did get a lot of genes from that, famously for things like immune function, but it's not all sunshines and brow ridges. So for example, um, there is a, a gene in, um, that's uh, prominent in many uh, non-African, uh, that is Eurasian populations, that um, helps with um, blood clotting. And it's a gene that originated uniquely in Neanderthals. Well, you think about the rough and tumble world uh, of, uh, of that time, and anything that would help the blood to clot is a variation that would be selected to stay in the human, the, the Homo sapiens genome. It turns out that that gene from Neanderthals is a risk factor for strokes in Eurasians. That uh, gene for blood clotting that we inherited from Neanderthals is actually a risk factor medically, um, but it was advantageous at the time. Most of the genes weren't useful. Nature selected them out over thousands of years. It turned out people who didn't have those genes had a better advantage living their lives than people who did. And so over time, they were just kind of, kind of scraped out of the gene pool. And for example, chromosome two has almost no Neanderthal interaction on it at all. Chromosome two is connected to cognitive function and learning development, autism development, even sperm production. There are no Neanderthal genes that got into those, that, that part of the human genome which suggests that there were things that Neanderthals had that the human genome just said no to. Big X barrier, you, you cannot enter, ye shall not pass. Which is something incredible about how we look at archeology span and paleoanthropology today. We can look at our genome because we've sequenced the whole thing. So we can dig into it and see where things match up with genomes of other species that we, of ancient human, that we have also sequenced. And something that hit me really hard about that is that adaptation isn't one person learning something. Adaptation is literally everyone in the society changing. The population adapts, the person does not. 
So when we would move into a new area, it would take forever for us to adapt. Generations of us combining with the locals, a la like a bonobos mixing sex and friendship and hey, what's up, welcome, how you doing, let's go in here. Uh, we took over camp by camp or mountain by mountain, the way Teresa mentioned earlier. But either way, adaptation is super powerful for humanity and we seem to have good luck getting genes that we need to succeed. So next, <laughs> symbolism. The language is something that's really, um, I think fundamental to who we are and pretty different from the way other animals communicate um, and the other animals communicate in pretty fancy ways. Language and abstract thought is what helped us take over. We as humans, we can um, speak about past events, we can speak about future events, we can plan for the future, we can speak about something like a third party told us and then hold that information in our brain and use that to process and make decisions. But the challenge for us as paleoanthropologists is how do you identify language in the archeological record. Teresa and other experts in paleoanthropology had a puzzle that they had to solve because you can't fossilize thought. You can't mummify speech. You can't preserve social interaction in the stone. Well, I mean, you can, but writing wasn't around yet. So how do you know what a culture was thousands of years after it's gone? There's no written language. There's no library. Everything was face to face. You have to look for symbolic things that they carried around with them. For example, a quarter. This has meaning. From this quarter, we can learn economic systems, token economies with fiat currencies. You can also learn metallurgy and technology required to make this, to mass produce it. You could learn if you just found this one quarter from a society about the alloys and metals required to make it and how that society had technology in order to do that. You can learn about the iconography that's on the coin, values, writing systems, multiple quarters. If you find like lots of them, you can learn numbering systems and you can find coins of differing values and learn even more iconography and more about the economic systems and cultural information of that society. Just from a coin. It's a small thing, but pennies that make it into landfills could inform future paleoanthropologists looking back at us in the 21st century. For ancient humans, their quarter is a little bead. Beads are, are um, as far as we understand it, don't have a practical purpose. They don't allow you to hunt better, get more calories, um, things like that. Um, they're, they're in modern times, a, a communication device. Um, this, is, this is something that I'm signaling to my um, other people I'm meeting or people within my group. So this is a fossil shell that a Neanderthal had found uh, probably a hundred kilometers or so away from this site, carried it and then left it at uh, Fomane, perhaps lost it. That's already interesting. But this shell also has red pigment on the outside, not inside. And it seems to have sort of uh, wear or, you know, slight polish as if it has been carried or, or rubbed or something like this. So this is an object that is does not have a functional, a clear functional context. It doesn't seem to, to be part of of any kind of tool that we could think of really. We don't have that baseline for the antels. We don't allow them to have that. So um but because there's just no other explanation for that, then something that's to do with aesthetics or uh, some kind of social meaning for them. And once you, if you accept that example, then it makes you see other contexts rather differently. So humans could adapt, and then we could add symbolic information to something. Humans are a combination of all of these different bits that have come before them. And we learned that race is a construct, right? We've learned that throughout all of human history at this point, that that 1% of DNA that is different is everything that is different about us, but we have been able to divide ourselves in all these little groups and stuff, and, and it doesn't make any sense because we are all part of the same family. We are all the same species. We all have the same power, if you will. However, it's not a family tree, it's not linear. It's more of a family bush. And even that might be wrong. Rebecca said, it's more like a river. Yeah, one of the, the ways to think about it that sort of is a bit more visual even than, than a bush is like a river, which is made up of many little streams and they intermingle and they go off for a while and then they come back. And so that's more like what it is. And in some of those rivulets, you know, 
things might slow down for a while and others it's running fast and you know so that's a really good mental image for people to have i think I don't want to kick this dead horse here, but there are some adaptations that are more powerful than others, like cooking. Cooking food allowed us to get bigger brains. We get nutrients from things that would have normally been inedible. Root vegetables and grains. Neanderthal teeth have microfossils in their plaque because they didn't brush. You know, brush your teeth, kids. That stuff gets in there. And there's grass and nuts and legumes in there, and it's possible that they eat chamomile and yarrow, chamomile tea, actually, which got here soothed stomachs and yarrow is medicinal it actually helps with blood flow restriction easing toothaches of course they could also have just been eating the contents of other animals stomachs which apparently has the consistency of cream cheese Ugh. And we could talk about these kind of adaptations forever because there are so many different ones. The Inuit might be able to digest fats better than Westerners. The indigenous of Southwest United States might be able to eat corn, beans, and squash and have slender bodies, which Western cultures would not be able to do. And that's just some examples. But let's move on to number three, cumulative culture. At some point, humans became OP. We started to take over everything. And you can think of this like a Gladwell tipping point. Modern humans were also potentially getting more um, rabbits, birds, fishing comes in later, um, but just diverse, having a more diverse, diverse diet, which is probably related to their technology. They had this cumulative culture that allowed for these more technological advances, things like maybe traps, snares, all of that, and they were getting more of The first um, Homo sapiens that end up in Europe were able to actually, their remains and their, their stone tools are found in places that are even colder than the Neanderthals could inhabit. They uh, had at their archeological sites evidence of trading uh, shell beads from 500 uh, kilometers away, um, say uh, 300 miles uh, away. And um, so that showed that they were part of social networks that could that had a very wide geography and that helped them um, to uh, to persist when times were rough um, in different places that they uh, found themselves in. And so these uh, social networks, the uh, ability to innovate technologically and to have cumulative culture to make new inventions uh, seem to have been one of the ways in which uh, Homo sapiens um, survived. The behavioral processes of um, learning how to make um, stone tools, learning how to make bone tools, learning how to make pottery, um, and all of that accumulates um, and becomes more, overall broadly speaking, more complex. The cultural processes become more complex through time. Capacity for cumulative culture is one of the things that we as humans do uh, based in our language that I think is pretty fundamental to why we've been able to do all of the things that we've done that's, in my view, a little bit different than what other animals do, what other mammals do. Evolution is a slow process. Genes change here and there, whole populations adapt, and over thousands of years of trial and error, we slowly change as well as we change ourselves, we change our populations, we change our societies, we change our cultures. A baby is born that does something differently, and maybe that baby grows up with some advantages over hundreds of generations. There's lots of babies, lots of advantages, and those little teeny advantages take over the world. Whole populations develop symbolic communication. They can share that meaning with their cumulative culture. The brain starts to change, and we become better. Once communication becomes symbolic, for example, the cumulative culture kind of does not allow it to go back. It's hard to not continue to be symbolic once you start. Imagine if I call something a rock. You can't imagine not having that name. And you need to start naming other things, because if this is a rock, what is that? Is that a stone? Is that a boulder? Is that a mountain? Are they all a rock? Different cultures are, of course, going to choose different kind of segmentation of their symbolism, but they pass that knowledge on, creating a cumulative culture. It's essentially, if you think of it, learning over time. We're passing on our knowledge to others. And that knowledge is what makes us human today. If you took it all away, we couldn't build houses, we couldn't build computers, we couldn't, we'd live in caves. We'd be right back where we started and we'd have to get that cumulative culture again. Homo sapiens weren't just real smart. We are social. We can communicate with each other and we can pass all of that down. That's what made us so powerful. That's why we won when other people didn't. We learned we needed to live near water and in hot and dry places, and we could tell each other where the water was. We could tell each other, and together 
we persisted. Speaking of persistence though, I used to work at this historic site and the Lieutenant Governor of Michelin Mackinac, Patrick Sinclair used to say, persistence wears down resistance. I love history. I love science. I love learning about literally everything that I can squeeze into my little brain, whether I am watching documentaries somewhere like Curiosity Stream or learning about strange niches and passions of digital creators on Nebula or reading books from the library, which I actually do a lot. I love to learn. And if you love learning new things, then you should snap up this Nebula Curiosity Stream bundle ASAP. Curiosity Stream has tons of big budget documentaries and they cover everything from psychology to engineering, from the future to ancient cultures, from deep space to the bottom of the ocean. How many other big things can I throw in here? They have got it all. And right now with my promo code, which is here, you can get CS for a year and you'll get Nebula too. Nebula is a streaming service that I helped start with a group of other learners. And if you join CS right now, you get Nebula for free. Nebula has dozens of creators uploading new stuff every day about history and infrastructure, psychology and engineering, physics and math. Seriously, you can learn for years with this bundle. Just by joining, you directly support us, the creators. To do it is simple. Just join Curiosity Stream with my code, curiositystream.com slash trace, promo code trace. Link is down in the description. If you do that, you get Nebula for free and the bundle for less than 15 bucks a year. Signing up nets you both, and you can listen to David Attenborough narrating tales of tiny hummingbirds and dig into the idiosyncrasies of film with Patrick Willems. And one last time, curiositystream.com slash trace, link down below, promo code is trace, only 124 cents a month, and you can feel good about it because clicking that link directly helps me keep this this channel going. So thank you to y'all that signed up already. I can see you in the analytics. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, enough talking about learning. Yeah, let's go learn some more. So far, there is no rule that says that we keep going. There have been dozens and dozens of really successful attempts by advanced apes and primates to take over the planet. And we are the most successful so far. There's no rule that because we have spread so far and done so much that we should continue. The biggest threat to us might be us. More on that next time. We're gonna talk about climate change and how it will affect our continuing evolution. So make sure you come back. Thank you so much for subscribing if you have already. If you haven't clicked subscribe, just go right down there. It's so easy to do. Just boop, you've done it. It's great. So awesome to have you here with me. I am Trace. You can find me anywhere on the internet by looking for Trace Dominguez. Thank you, homo cousins. I'm so excited that you were able to stick around and watch this video and I will see you in the future.